Hey guys, how the hell are you? Today, we are going to do an all-new unbiased gear review on this. The LTD Aero 1000. <laughs> But first, some specs on this guitar. We have neck through body construction with mahogany body wings glued onto a three-piece maple neck. We have a bound Macassar ebony fretboard with 24 stainless steel frets, which is a recent update to the 1000 series from LTD. We have what LTD's website or rather ESP Guitars' website, I should say, refers to as a 1000 Series Floyd Rose Special Edition bridge because it's got the stainless steel screws on it, but most people would probably argue that that is a 1500 Series bridge. Let's just go with what the website says. It's 1000 Series Special Edition. We have a master volume knob on here, a three-way toggle switch, and a pair of EMG humbuckers. 81 in the bridge, 85 in the neck. So, first of all, aesthetically speaking, this is a beautiful, made for molten fucking metal instrument. I love offset Vs. I've owned quite a few of them in my day. It's definitely something that is obviously based off of the Jackson Rhodes, probably something that is also a little bit based off of the Alexi model ESP's version of the Jackson Rhodes, um, with a little bit of an extended cutaway down here, but recent sort of updates to that body style, at least in recent years, have included this sort of cutout that's right here, a little bit different beveling pattern to the body, which I think looks super cool. It looks even more weaponized, which is absolutely rad. I love this candy apple satin finish. It's one of those things that, you know, it, it's, it's striking. It's not necessarily the first finish you would immediately think of on this body shape. You'd probably think of black, you'd probably think of white. You might even think of like maybe a cool custom shop graphic like a blood red drip, something like that. But this candy apple really, really pops, especially with the black hardware and especially with the stainless steel accents from the screws. Aesthetically, this is a damn appealing instrument. I love that headstock. It just looks so good with that logo with the drop shadow on it. Speaking of the aesthetics, but also going into a little bit of the quality control, honestly, this is an instrument that is resoundingly positive, so don't think that I'm just starting right off right here. It's just a good point to talk about it. Kind of the only real problem that I've found with this instrument is a little bit of the finish work. Looking at some of the points on the instrument, in particular up at the headstock, there's just something here. It's not necessarily like a chip or a ding or anything like that. Like when you actually feel it and when you look at it closely, you can tell that it is sanded perfectly even. It's meant to be like that. It almost looks as if a little bit of the finish just didn't necessarily make it onto the point for lack of a better description. It just seems like something is missing a little bit here. 
Besides that, taking a look around where the binding is on the neck, it feels a little funky when you're running your hands across it, almost like there's a little bit of a lip there, a little bit of overlap maybe. Taking a look at certain spots, you can almost see a little bit of sort of mask bleed where maybe the masking that was put down over the binding wasn't quite down far enough and so a little bit of the red just kind of moseyed on over to where the binding is. It's just one of those things that, honestly, are you going to give a shit about it when you're playing it? Probably not. But if you are looking at an instrument and you are trying to make sure it is 100% perfect top to bottom, not necessarily saying that this should be like custom shop perfection at about a thousand dollar price point. But if that is what you're looking at, you're looking all over to see if there's any sort of imperfections whatsoever. That's kind of the biggest glaring one is the way that the paint kind of hits up to the binding of the fretboard and the neck. Other than that, there's nothing bad about this instrument really at all. Taking a look all over the rest of the instrument, looking for finish burrs, cannot find them whatsoever. Taking a look at the fretwork, the fretwork is beautiful. It's nice and level all along the fretboard, but also all along that fretboard edge, exactly what I want. There's absolutely no sharpness. There's no fret sprout. If there ever was any, it's probably kept in check by that binding on the side of the fretboard. The fret edges themselves are rolled off. It's not super ball end rolled off like you would find on... Rolled off? Wow. It's not super ball end rolled off like you would find on a super high end custom shop guitar, something in like the 4000 and up range but it is very, very nicely rounded off, no sharpness to speak of, and the fretboard edge is also rolled off a little bit too for maximum comfort and playability. The locking nut is just a little bit in from the edge of the fretboard, so there is a little bit where it just doesn't line up nice and flush right up here. You're never going to notice it while you're playing though. So just fair warning, that exists. In my opinion, it's negligible, but it just does bear mentioning a little bit. The Floyd Rose trim, nice and stable. Bang around on this, bash around on this, do all sorts of crazy shit. And it just keeps snapping back in tune just like it's supposed to, just like a properly set up. Floyd Rose ought to do. I love the minimalistic controls. I love just having a three-way toggle switch. I do kind of like having tone controls on my guitars, and I'm not going to lie, on this one, I did kind of end up missing it a little bit just because the pickups themselves are a little teeny tiny bit chirpy. That's something that's kind of part and parcel when you have the EMGs, but... I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. We'll do the tone demo in a little bit here. As far as like a personal preference thing with regards to the controls, I would have probably liked it if the knob and the switch were swapped. I think I might have liked it having the volume knob down here to roll it off just whenever I'm done playing and then having the switch here so that I can easily go back and forth if I was in a live setting and needed to switch up to do some leads, something like that. Is it something that's necessarily going to be a deal breaker for most players? Absolutely not. Totally a personal preference thing. I love the comfort of this extra cutaway that's right here. It's really easy to get in there to the upper frets if you want to do some shredding. I love the contour of the neck. It's kind of a nice, super thin, um, I wouldn't necessarily call it a U. I would call it like a C profile. Basically, if, if you've played any LTDs, ESPs, hell, even Jacksons of the last 20 to 25 years, you're going to be familiar with this neck profile. It's nice and comfortable. It's nice and familiar. Taking a look at the backside of the instrument, a nice aesthetic thing that they've done, but it's also an actual comfort and playability thing. All of the cavity covers are recessed into the body a little bit so that that way they're a little bit more out of the way. It's just 
kind of one of those nice things that you don't really think about too much when you're first checking out an instrument. But I promise you, when you've got it pressed up against your body to play, it is one of those things that, hey, you've got that belt buckle that's just big enough. This could potentially catch on it. So the fact that they're recessed is nice. There again, another personal preference thing. If anything, I just would have liked it if the actual dish itself, the jack dish, was just recessed in a little bit as well. I think that would have made that a little bit more comfortable as well. That's kind of the only real thing here, except for, of course, the hardware and whatnot that isn't actually recessed into the body. So just there again, I, I feel like if, if they were going to do that for this, I think that they should have done it for this. Is that going to be a deal breaker for most people? Hell no. It's still a badass guitar, and I'm absolutely loving playing it so far. But enough of my yammering. Let's go into the tone demo. So how does this thing sound? Dude, it's an LTD guitar with EMGs in it. It's a sound that you've heard countless times. It's a sound you've probably played on countless times. But, so that you guys can hear it. It's rich, it's full, it is compressed like you would expect from active pickups, and these are kind of the archetypal active pickups. These are what you've heard on countless records over the past 30 years, so nothing new, nothing that we're unfamiliar with, and as a result, pretty much any guitar that you get with them has that certain sound to it, where it's just compressed, it's relatively even, all across the board, but still with enough brightness to cut through, with enough meat behind the palm mutes to really just kind of hit you in the chest through the right amp. And right now we're playing through the KSR Orthos and some of those new George Lynch cabinets from Two Notes. <laughs> Just nice, perfect for that molten metal tone. But when you're doing those fast tremolo picking runs, still enough note clarity and definition that you're going to get fantastic tone pretty much no matter what you're doing with it.
So overall, my final thought, this is exactly what it's supposed to be. It's an extremely aesthetically metal fucking instrument. I love the shape. I love the appointments. All the features that you have on here are kind of typical of a great metal instrument. The EMG pickups that whether you love them, whether you hate them, you can't deny that these things have been kind of the voice of a generation, so to speak, ever since about the late 80s. This is the fucking metal pickup set, especially that 81 in the bridge. That is literally sort of the cornerstone of metal tone, arguably, for the past 30 or so years. So it sounds awesome. It plays awesome. It's nice and stable as far as tuning goes. It's nice and comfortable. And goddamn if it don't look really, really awesome as well. So yeah, I, I think that this thing is an absolute winner. I think that the price point is great for this thing. I've seen it at a little bit different price points depending on where you find it online, but roughly between about a thousand to a thousand and fifty depending on the online retailer and i think this is definitely an instrument that is worth that given all the features given the fact that it's got stainless steel frets that are honestly done rather nicely i mean i would be happy i i'd be happy hanging on to this thing instead of just having this here for review purposes it's that solid of an instrument and i actually love it very very much but Arnold, what are you drinking today? I am so glad that you asked. Let's go to the beer fridge. Let's pull out something tasty and delicious. Let's find out what I'm drinking today. Today, from Rincon Brewery, we are having Bates Blonde, which is something that my good buddy, Mr. Dan Eaton, who you guys know from the various Nam Hangs, from some of the videos that have appeared on this channel in the past, you know he's been my best bro for two decades, and he dropped off a six-pack of this uh, when last he visited. This is a pretty damn delicious brew, if I do say so myself. Pours a super crisp, clear, golden color. Really pretty. Nice white head to it. Right from the aroma, it's very, very crisp. You do get a little bit of a maltiness there too, a little bit of subtle sweetness that's coming through in the aroma. And see, this is awesome because even though it's a blonde ale, it's a little bit more complex than a lot of blonde ales that I've had recently in that it kind of is bridging a sort of taste gap between traditional pilsners and traditional like hell style lagers. There's a little bit of a malty sweetness in here, almost like a very, very subtle sweet corn kind of taste that's kind of lingering in there. But there's also a slight hoppiness. It's not a bitter IPA hoppiness. It's just kind of a light little tinge that just hits the back of your cheeks a little bit. It's really nice, nice mouthfeel, nice aftertaste that doesn't linger and just kind of like leave you with that dry mouthfeel. Yeah, it's just barely rich, but at the same time, extremely, extremely drinkable. This is 5.5% alcohol by volume. Once again, this is Rincon Brewery out of Carpinteria, California. It is so goddamn good and very, very enjoyable. So thank you guys so much for tuning in. Please remember to like this video and subscribe to this channel. There's tons more metal and guitar oriented content to come. And please remember, take what you do seriously, but do not take yourselves too seriously.